All right. Good evening and welcome to one and all. This is Ankita from Clarnet, the assigned session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used digital platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And topic of today's session is Lecture Series 27. Let's begin today's session, for which I would like to invite Dr. Anjali Ma'am to take over. Over to you, Ma'am. Kindly proceed with your talk. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bino, who, uh, who is chairing today's uh, session. He's the chief consultant anesthesiologist and intensivist at Sri Shankara Center in Bengaluru. He's been associated with the Indian Society uh, for Pain. The Karnataka chapter as both its past honorary secretary and as the past president. He's currently the EC member of uh, SOPSI, as we all know. He's especially interested in IRAS, which is a topic for today, and also in clinical nutrition. Over to you, Dr. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I thank Anjali ma'am for giving us this opportunity to present uh, on the ERAS protocols and uh, its implementation in uh, daily practice. As you all know, uh, the concept of ERAS was first introduced by Henrik Kellett sometime in the 1997. And now it is widely used in uh, most of the hospitals, not only in India, but also abroad. And it has sort of become a standard of care for uh, the surgeries. Uh, we know that uh, there are several papers also showing that ERAS, by implementing ERAS, it not only improves the clinical outcomes and the quality of care, but it also significantly reduces the cost of hospitalization. Today we have my colleague, Dr. Sucheta, she is a junior consultant in uh, Sri Shankara Cancer Hospital and Research Center. And her main interests are uh, regional anesthesia and RAS. She'll be presenting on the RAS protocols and implementation in onco surgery. Uh, over to you, Sucheta. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, so, today I will be talking about uh, ERAS and Onco surgery, its uh, concepts and uh, implementation. Back in the early 90s, we saw revolutionary changes in anesthesia, that is, the invent of uh, regional anesthesia, drugs to control the pain, and even with respect to the surgery, uh, they started the laparoscopic approach and the minimally invasive approach. So, by late 1990s, this fast track concept of major surgery was first pioneered by Professor Henry Kellett. He's a surgeon from the University of Denmark. His uh, initial observations were that patients who uh, had early feeding and early ambulations, it caused lesser complications. So to in 2001, a group of uh, interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary group, which included physicians, surgeons, and anesthesiologists, they started working on changing the traditional practices to evidence-based protocols. And in 2010, the ERAS Society was officially founded. So what does ERAS mean or what do they do? It is ERAS programs are evidence-based protocols designed to standardize and optimize the perioperative medical care in order to reduce surgical trauma, perioperative physiological stress and organ dysfunction related to the elective procedures. The ERAS protocol involves a myriad of uh, uh, protocols that is preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative. Each one of them we will go through about it. So on what basis are these recommendations done? So basically they have searched the literature from the Medline, Embase and the Cochrane uh, databases. Uh, up until 2014, the last ERAS recommendation for anesthesiologists was done in 2015. And they have come up with either a strong versus a weak recommendation 
strong recommendation implies that the panelists are 100% confident that whatever protocol is implemented, the desirable effect far outweighs the undesirable effect. Whereas a weak recommendation is the desirable effect is still more better than the undesirable effect, but the panelists are not actually confident about it. And the evidence level is low, moderate or high depending upon the literature data that is available. So why should the anesthesiologist follow ERAS? Uh, based on the ERAS protocols, there are a certain set of anesthesia practices which they found that has a very higher impact on mortality and morbidity. Thus, the ERAS protocols are into pre-intra and post-operative protocols. The first thing is the pre-operative counseling. Uh, it is imperative to walk through both the patient and the caregiver regarding evaluation, optimization, the surgical process, the recovery path. How does it help the patient? It basically allays their anxiety. It helps them to know why they are going through this process. Coming to the preoperative ERAS elements, uh, the first one would be the preoperative risk stratification. This comes with a strong level of recommendation because 80% of the post-operative mortality is from the high risk group and further evaluation, optimization and deciding on their perioperative care path helps us to uh, give a better care for the patient. There are multiple risk ind uh, indices which have been uh, uh, implemented by the ERAS. Uh, I will not go into detail of each index because we are well aware of that. The only difference is uh, in the shuttle walk test and in the cardiopulmonary exercise test where it comes with both a strong and a moderate recommendation. Why is that? Both of these tests are extremely sensitive. That is, they will tell you that the patient comes under a high risk category, but they are not patient specific because they will not tell you whether to take up a patient for a particular surgery or not. Uh, next will be the optimization of comorbidities. This also does come with a uh, set of uh, recommendations. Smoking cessation and uh, nicotine replacement therapy is under high recommendation. Alcohol cessation is under low because usually it takes around 6 to 12 weeks for uh, complete treatment and we do not have the time to optimize a patient for 12 weeks. And uh, definitely medical optimization comes under recommendation that is anemia, diabetes, hypertension, asthma and cardiovascular conditions. Prehabilitation. This forms the most important part of a, a preoperative workup of the ERAS. Uh, initially, it had a weak or a moderate level of evidence, but the present papers suggest a very strong evidence level and thus even though initially the recommendation level was weak, at present it has gone into a stronger recommendation. I think here we can clearly see how a patient who has been prehabilitated by the ERAS has a good recovery pathway compared to someone who has not been prehabilitated. And because there is a steep decrease in the surgical pro uh, procedure and in the rehabilitation phase. This is in a case where there has been no complications. Consider a situation where the patient is not prehabilitated and there are surgical complications. So the patient is not prehabilitated and the graph clearly shows that they may not even achieve a minimal level of independent function. So thus, uh, the earlier uh, protocols have been modified and even the ESPEN guidelines, that is the European Society on uh, Nutrition, have given out a recent guidelines that the patient should have a protein supplementation of around 1.5 gram per kg per day. They should be supplemented either orally, enterally or parenterally. That is a strong recommendation. Increased physical activity is a strong recommendation. And patients with upper GI cancer who, are, who come under the category of the most malnourished patients, they have to be supplemented with immunonutrition, especially the omega-3 fatty acids and nucleotides. Pre-anesthetic medications, uh, short-acting benzodiazepines better be avoided in the elderly and long-acting an anxiolytics and opioids to be avoided as they delay the discharge and this comes with a strong recommendation. Pre-operative fasting and carbohydrate loading, 
ERAS very strictly has a protocol that it has to be just a two hours of fasting for clear fluids and six hours for uh, solids. Avoid overnight fasting and it is a strong recommendation. So why are we uh, fasting the patients only for two hours for fluids? Uh, this fasting of the patients, the early removal of the nasogastric tube and early feeding. All this is in a continuum and I'll explain you why it is important. This is because of the concept of insulin resistance. So what is it? It is basically a condition where a normal concentration of insulin produces a subnormal biological response. And the degree of the uh, patient's insulin sensitivity on the first post-operative day has a direct impact on the length of the stay. So why is insulin resistance important to us? Because of its metabolic sequelae, that is the glucose and the protein metabolism. Glucose metabolism will cause hyperglycemia and we have sufficient data to show that hyperglycemia itself is a predictor of mortality and complications. And even a moderate amount of hyperglycemia has an 18-fold increase in hospital mortality. And coming to the protein catabolism, because surgery is an insult to the patient's uh, catabolic state, there is a uh, protein breakdown in the patients. So uh, patients uh, who, undergo, who undergo surgery will have protein catabolism. And if there is insulin resistance, there will be delayed wound healing, delayed immunity, and decreased muscle strength. So what does decreased muscle strength imply? That the patient will become extremely weak. Even a simple rehabilitation procedures like coughing out the secretions, ambulation, or if a patient is on ventilator, they will go on a prolonged ventilation and difficulty to wean out, which increases the length of the stay in the hospital. So what does ERA suggest to overcome insulin resistance? It is two hours for liquids and six hours for solids. Uh, epidural analgesia, that is a good uh, pain coverage so that the patient does not have a nociception and vomiting because of the pain early post-operating feeding and have a good glycemic control that is by insulin administration because insulin sensitivity is affected and not the responsiveness. Next is the mechanical bowel preparation. Uh, it has been shown that uh, at present doing a mechanical bowel preparation should be avoided as much as possible. If it is required, it has to be under an antibiotic cover. It comes with a strong recommendation grade. Antibiotic thromboprophylaxis, uh, we definitely know that cancer and major surgery are the highest causing, uh, highest, highest agents causing the venous thromboembolism. Low molecular weight heparin is preferable and along with that SCD and elastic uh, stockings can also be used. This also does come with a strong recommendation grade. Antimicrobial prophylaxis and uh, skin preparation, the prophylaxis should be given within an uh, half an hour or an hour before the skin incision and it should be repeated once in three to four hours intraoperatively and skin preparation with chlorhexidine is preferable. It comes with a strong recommendation. Coming to the intraoperative ERAS elements, uh, with sufficient evidence, we have the recommendation of maintaining a MAC of 0.8 to 1.3 or a bispectral index of 40 to 60. Uh, these are the uh, basic anesthesia guidelines. I'm not going in depth with them. For induction, propofol is the standard of care and for inhalation, it is sevoflurane. Airway management, supraglottic airway devices are the preferable ones because they are better tolerated and no need of a muscle relaxant. Emergence is more caution to be exerted in patients with risk of aspiration. Maintenance of anesthesia, it is totally the choice of the anesthetist whether to go for an inhalational or a TIVA. Inhalational is easy to administer, cardioprotective, but does come with a higher post-operative nausea vomiting. Whereas TIVA reduced PONV, whereas the cost increases, emergence is delayed and need an EEG-based monitoring. Uh, use of inhalational anesthesia is with low fresh gas flow. Avoid deeper anesthesia. The surgical stimulus is different throughout the surgery. So balance between the depth of anesthesia and analgesia is required. Coming to the neuromuscular blockade, if, the, uh, if there is inadequate uh, reversal of the neuromuscular blockade, it can impair the hypoxic ventilator response. There can be pharyngeal dysfunction with aspiration risk and upper obstruction. 
So the ERAS recommends monitoring of the neuromuscular function. Opioids, they have the benefit of being acting synergistically with propofol, the sealing effect and the best analgesia, but it does have the side effects of PONV, urinary retention, respiratory depression, uh, delayed discharge and hyperalgesia. Mechanical ventilation, uh, use of optimal lung protective ventilator strat strategies. Uh, mild hypercapnia is advisable. This is specifically mentioned in the ARAS protocol and maintaining a ETCO2 of equal to or more than 40. Uh, it has been shown by uh, certain uh, papers that it improves the tissue oxygenation and it has been recommended to keep an ETCO2 more than 40. Under uh, intravenous anesthesia, the therapeutic hypercapnia it inhibits the local and the systemic uh, inflammation and it also improves the respiratory function. So thus, maintenance of hypercapnia is recommended. Uh, coming to the use of uh, inspired oxygen, we have this uh, proxy trial. Initially, the WHO recommended for a use of 80% of FiO2 in uh, colon surgeries where they, uh, in the same proxy trial, as a short-term follow-up, they found that patients had less level of surgical site infection and uh, better healing of anastomosis. But in the same trial, when they did a long-term follow-up, they understood that patients who were administered more than 80% of the oxygen had a significantly increased long-term mortality. And even the uh, authors were not sure as to why this, uh, why this was a correlation. So, and it was significant in patients undergoing cancer surgery uh, more, more so than in the non-cancer patient. Thus, the present recommendation is to use an inspired fractional concentration just enough to maintain a normal oxygen level and saturation. Pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen is recommended. Uh, the next uh, protocol will be prevention of intraoperative hypothermia. We have good amount of papers right from 1996 uh, explaining to us what happens when the patient under uh, patient ends up with hypothermia? There is incidence of surgical, uh, maintaining a normothermia will reduce the incidence of surgical wound infection and shorten the hospitalization duration. And again, we know that maintaining normothermia reduces even the incident of cardiac events. As we can see, even a mild intraoperative hypothermia prolongs the post anesthetic recovery. So, Hypothermia basically reduces the tissue oxygen tension by vasoconstriction and reduces the leukocyte superoxide production. If there is delayed anesthesia recovery, it causes increase in the length of the stay of the hospital. And here we have a paper in 2008 which uh, exactly tells us how much that hyper hypothermia have a uh, adverse effect on the patient. A mild hypothermia, like even a difference of one degree Celsius, may significantly increase the blood loss by approximately six and increase the risk of transfusion by around 22 percent. And surgical hypothermia itself is an independent predictor of early perioperative complications and overall survival after a cytoreductive surgery for ovarian cancer. Thus, the recommendation from the ERAS is for the prevention of hypothermia, use of active warming devices, and prevention of shivering by the use of drugs. It comes with a strong recommendation. Next is this nasogastric tube. The recommendation is that the prophylactic use is not advisable. Use in gastrectomy and esophagectomy is debatable. To be used in patients with delayed gastric emptying, it comes with a strong recommendation. But why does, why is, what is the basis for this recommendation is that basically uh, the stomach has this uh, migrating motor complexes. So in the fasting state, the stomach is empty. Only when you fill the stomach, uh, because of the distension that is caused in the walls of the stomach, the migrating motor complexes are activated and active peristalsis begins. So if there is a continuous use of uh, nasogastric tube and you are constantly emptying out the stomach, then it will delay the activation of the uh, uh, peristalsis. And regarding this nasogastric removal, it is actually debatable. It is more so about monitoring the patient on post-operative day two. 
even if a patient if uh, we can definitely remove the nasogastric tube on uh, pod 0 or pod 1 and on day 2 the monitoring is about whether the patient is having a bloating sensation vomiting nausea not past platelets then maybe we can think of reinsertion but these complications usually happen in uh, post op day 2 to 3 and uh, monitoring and reinsertion is better advised rather than uh, just using it as a blanket therapy for all the patients uh, next protocol is about the perioperative hemodynamic management. Uh, it has been well noted that the hypovolemia can cause postoperative complications, morbidity and mortality, which has been uh, well documented even in a national confidential inquiry into the perioperative deaths. Uh, first, I'll tell you the recommendations that have been done by the ERAS and then I'll tell you why it has been done. The, the recommendations are zero fluid balance approach, uh, perioperative weight gain of more than 2.5 kgs to be avoided, goal directed fluid therapy, use of inotropes and vasopressors, colloid to be used to treat objective evidence of hypovolemia, and in the absence of surgical losses, discontinue the IV fluids in the post op period and encourage an oral intake. So, of this, I know zero fluid balance approach is really difficult to approach clinically. So what do, we, uh, what do we do? We have to go for the goal-directed fluid therapy. And how do we go about it? We have evidence to show that dynamic parameters such as stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, pulse contour analysis, and the uh, transesophageal uh, doctor. With the help of this, uh, we can know that there is an objective evidence that the patient will respond to the fluids. So only when we have this objective, uh, objective evidence, we should be filling up the patient with fluids. And when is it meaningful? It becomes more meaningful only in uh, clinically meaningful in high risk patients. And it should always be the cardiac output should be guided by the hemodynamic therapy algorithm. When to give colloids? The Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee has come to a conclusion that when crystalloids alone are not sufficient to maintain the uh, pressures of a patient, then colloids can be used, but it should be used in the lowest effective dose and for the shortest period of time. And this also should be used along with the continuous hemodynamic monitoring. So that's the ERAS recommendation. Uh, I think you will be able to understand better now that this goal directed fluid therapy, it is the recommendation is strong in high risk patients, whereas it is not so in the low risk patients. Uh, perioperative near zero balance recommendation is just moderate, but use of advanced hemodynamic monitoring comes with a strong recommendation grade. Emergence considerations, uh, the primary aim is to wash out the inhaled anesthetic and prevent the carbon dioxide buildup. Pressure support ventilation to maintain the functional residual capacity, tracheal extubation in an upright position, and avoid post-operative hypoventilation. Use supplemental oxygen with caution, and if there is a recurrent hypoxemia, treat with a CPAP or a HFNC rather than just increasing the FiO2. Coming to the post-operative uh, ERAS elements, pain management, uh, of course, the recommendation is on multimodal analgesia. Pain relief should be so well adequate that the patient is able to be mobilized early and able to tolerate the oral feeds. The analgesia to be procedure specific and opioid side effects are dose dependent and opioid sparing techniques can be implemented. The recommendation uh, grade is uh, there for both open surgery and laparoscopic surgery. For open surgeries, uh, the epidural and thoracic epidural analgesia comes with a strong recommendation, whereas the tap blocks come with a moderate recommendation. And for laparoscopic surgery, tap blocks and IT morphin come with a moderate recommendation. Postoperative delirium. It is the most underestimated and the underdiagnosed clinical scenario. Uh, this is basically a condition where the patient has an altered consciousness orientation, memory, thought perception or behavior and even possibly an altered sleep pattern which has developed acutely and it shows a fluctuating clinical course. The promoting factors for this is the elderly age group, 
use of benzodiazepines anxiety preoperative anxiety in a patient preoperative altered sleep patterns deep anesthesia and the use of opioids also treatment it is basically the use of haloperidol and uh, uh, atypical neuroleptics so the eras recommendation is screening for delirium is important and symptom oriented treatment try to avoid the delirogenic medications Uh, the next recommendation is on attenuation and treatment of post op ileus uh, basically the post op ileus is defined as a transient reduction of the bowel motility that prevents effective transit of the bowel contents it can be either primary or secondary primary uh, ileus is where it is not accompanied by any surgical complications such as anastomotic anastomotic leak secondary is it is accompanied by the surgical complications strategies that are recommended for uh, prevention of this post op ileus is intraoperatively go for a laparoscopic or a robotic surgery adequate analgesia cover either with epidural or with an nsaids and avoid fluid excess and splanchnic hypoperfusion in the post operative period again the analgesia cover early mobilization use of chewing gum early feeding and removal of the nasogastric tube all of this comes with a moderate grade of recommendation uh, post operative nausea and vomiting the incidence is around 20 to 30% but in high risk patients it, it is as high as 70% uh, what we regularly use is the apfel scoring system which has just four parameters female gender non smoking history of motion sickness or prior history of uh, post op nausea vomiting and the use of post operative opioids each scoring will increase your percentage as 10 20 40 60 and 80% so what happens if a patient has multiple uh, episodes of nausea and vomiting it does not allow them to move freely in the bed they are unable to eat and drink they are unable to walk it will require unnecessary extra giving of iv fluids and also the causing of electrolyte imbalance and uh, given that the anti emetic therapy is extremely low cost and its availability is good sorry and its availability is good and a lower incidence of adverse effect suggestion is that patients need to be treated well for the pomb the recommendation by eras is if there are one to two risk factors go for a use of two anti emetics if there are 3 to 4 risk factors go for use of 2 to 3 antiemetics tva and opioid sparing analgesia uh, perianastomotic drain the early removal of drains is associated with decreased risk of uh, risk of fistula uh, abdominal and pulmonary complications it comes with a strong grade of recommendation and early ambulation uh, this comes with a strong grade of recommendation finally after we have learned all the protocols that have been advised by the eras the most important one is the audit audit is the one which tells us whether what we are doing for the patient is being useful or not that is a systematic audit improves the compliance and the clinical outcomes it does come with a strong level of recommendation so uh, to summarize this till now we have learned the rationale of the eras the evidence or based on which the rationale has been sub, uh, prescribed the practices recommended why how and when and the strength of recommendations so now we'll see what has eras done to the patients there has been a multi center trial, trial uh, where they compared four groups that is the open and the laparoscopic with and without the eras so the they found out that the introduction of the eras to the colonic surgery decreased the post op morbidity by around 40 to 50% and shortened the length of stay of the hospital by 2 to 3 days they also concluded that eras is safe feasible and there is improved clinical outcomes the at present there have been multiple studies to prove the benefit of the eras and this is what we can say the position of eras protocol in colorectal surgery is nowadays well established as the best care and it is very unlikely that future trials will change this uh 
we also have uh, papers where they found out that eras program in gynecological surgery significantly reduced the overall cost to a patient and this is in particular mention of anesthesia related interventions there was a decrease in transfusions and nausea this is about the urological surgeries recent analysis from the national surgical quality improvement program database it showed that there is a consistent decline in length of stay and transfusion rates once the eras protocol has been implemented for radical cystectomy patients so this uh, field of eras right now it is moving from a patient uh, till now we were seeing about the uh, short come out uh, benefits of the eras and slowly it is moving from this short come outcomes to the patient centric and longer term outcomes so a study has been done by feldman he basically uh, said this the phases of recovery overlap uh, the phases of recovery overlap and cannot be defined as a single event within a specific time frame different outcome measures are relevant at different time periods and no single outcome measure is perfect to quantify the total recovery basically what it is said that we have multiple components in the eras so it is not like i will apply one component and i want to see an end result it is and it is not even about patient not having a nausea or vomiting in a day one or patient getting discharged early it is about the overall recovery of the patient you implement a set of protocols on the patient the patient will recover the patient will go home and it is also important that the patient will have a quality of life after getting discharged from the hospital so the impact of eras on long term outcomes the adherence to the eras protocols can increase the long term survival as of now we have evidence even to tell that patients who had higher compliance that is more than 70% to the protocol had a reduced risk of five year cancer specific death and the most important one is this the restricted perio fluid therapy it has been shown to improve a five year survival a restrictive uh, comparative study with the non restrictive comparative study has uh, concluded that there is a lower uh, short term complication rates faster recovery sh shorter length of stay and improved five year survival uh yeah this is the same telling that uh, there is an improved five year survival so yes till now we talked about the components of eras and how eras has been uh, being beneficial to the patients but are we able to implement the eras is also a question uh to quote the eras website the immediate challenge the immediate challenge to improving the quality of surgical care is not discovering new knowledge but rather how to integrate what we already know into practice it takes an estimated average of around 17 years for only 14% of a new scientific discoveries to enter day to day clinical practice so this compliance with eras it is basically dose dependent as the compliance increases the complication decreases just the improvement from uh, the improvement is from if you are compliant from 50 to 90% the complication rates will be just 20% and there is a decrease in the length of the stay in the hospital by up to 4 days so are we really compliant uh, studies have also shown that the lowest compliance rates occurs post operatively and we do have the studies which exactly mention what are the barriers that exist just for the uh, implementation of the eras and i think uh, the most important factor will be the surgeon surgeons were not willing to change their practice but were supportive of changes in anesthesiologist dependent elements of perioperative care such as restrictive fluid therapy use of transverse abdominis plain block etc and surgeons were ready to accept only changes that do not interfere with their practice so how do we better the implementation rate it is not that eras has to be a rigid protocol where you cannot deviate from a set a set protocol 
try to have the idea of a flexible and an individualized method. So how do we go about implementing the ERAS? Uh, assemble a group of motivated uh, healthcare professionals, like a committee involving an anesthesiologist, a surgeon, a primary care nutritionist, physical therapist, nurses, and definitely the management. Identify an informal leader. Change not the organization, but the people who are willing to change. And for this, personal conviction and self-motivation is a must. And for this conviction to occur, the individual should have some amount of dissatisfaction or discontent with the things we are doing at present. Develop a protocol. The protocol need not be rigid. Identify the areas that pose difficulty and try to modify it as per the local circumstance or the culture. Educate the healthcare personnel and start with a pilot project in a relatively healthy patients. Uh, coming to the institutional data. Uh, in our institute, this ERAS is being followed from the past seven years. It's not that we have started implementing each and uh, every component of it on day one. We have started slow. We have started with a few components and slowly as we have observed the benefits the ERAS has been giving, uh, we have slowly uh, implemented multiple components. So what we do is uh, in the pre-operative part of the ERAS, counseling is done. Uh, rehabilitation involving walking, spirometer and nutritional supplementation is done. Uh, because a good amount of counseling is done, uh, there is no use of anxiolytics. We allow the ORS that is uh, around 200 ml to be taken two hours prior to the surgery and definitely optimization of comorbidities. In the intraoperative part, it includes the use of MAC of around 0.821, restrictive fluid goals and analgesia is definitely multimodal analgesia with either epidural or tap blocks or the NSAIDs. Uh, use of uh, warm IV fluids, body warmers, use of TEDs and sequential compression devices, and uh, use of IV dexamethasone and condensetron for antiemesis. In the post-operative part, we start the oral liquids by around 6 to 8 hours. Ambulation, spirometer, and the use of chewing gum is done. Continuation of the analgesia cover, early removal of the nasogastric tube, and thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. Uh, these are some of the statistics we have from our uh, uh, institute. The pre-medication, uh, in the pre-ERAS uh, protocol, we were using alprazolam, atenolol, esmoprazole, and domperidone, and glycopyrrolate was used during induction. But after the implementation of ERAS, we are only using esmoprazole and domperidone on a previous night. So the effect have been there is no dryness of mouth. Uh, there is reduced post-op drowsiness and better cognition in the patients. Uh, patients are well aware uh, and co conscious within one hour after extubation. And residual drowsiness is seen in less than 30% of the patients. Uh, coming to the opioids. At present, we are using morphine at around 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per kg or fentanyl at around 1 microgram per kg at induction. Uh, no major differences in the pain scores. Patients are more alert, less uh, incidence of nausea and vomiting, and incidence of hypotension at induction is more than half. So this is the incidence of hypotension post-induction uh, that uh, we are presently seeing. This is both because of uh, uh, decreased use of opioids and also that we have a fasting protocol of only of around six hours and maintaining normovolemia in the patient. Uh, intravenous fluids, uh, as of present, we use around two to three ml per kg body weight. Intermittent boluses whenever is required. There is increased use of uh, vasopressors in the intra. Uh, a urine output of even 0.3 ml per kg per hour is accepted. And there is a use of non-invasive cardiac output monitoring. Uh, the effects which we are seeing is definitely a fewer incidence of anastomotic leak, less puffy patients, and there is a marginal increase in the post-operative lactates. The uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting, our protocol is to use uh, 8 mg of dexamethasone and 4 mg of uh, ondansetron for all the patients in the interop period. And only ondansetron is continued for 2 to 3 days the incidence of vomiting has definitely dipped down to less than 1%. Uh, 
Uh, regarding post op nursing, there is a, a head up that is around 30 degree tilt. Stopping the oxygen around 30 minutes to one hour after shifting the patient to the uh, post op monitoring unit. Accepting saturation levels above 90% and definitely encouraging the chest physiotherapy, spirometer, and ambulation. Patients are uh, comfortable, better chest physiotherapy, reduced incidence of post operative atelectasis and reduced number of patients requiring supplemental oxygen in the wards. And coming to the nutrition part of it, the uh, RILS tube or the nasogastric tube is removed at around 8 to 12 hours after the colon surgeries. We encourage taking of the water, juice, tender coconut water, uh, also the use of chewing gums and peppermint around 8 to 10 hours after surgery. And the uh, enteral nutrition and the JJ feeds are started at around 24 to 36 hours after the upper GI surgery. This has been helpful in the way that there is a faster return of the bowel function, physical and both psychological comfort to the patient and definitely reduced feeling of tiredness by the patient. So uh, to summarize, ERAS protocols have been accepted as the standard of care in colorectal surgeries and at present it has been extended to all other branches of cancer surgeries. It is crucial to have a higher rate of compliance to the protocols to obtain the best results. There are several barriers to implementation, the most important one being the resistance to change. Thank you. Thank you, Sucheta. It was a very good and lucid uh, presentation. And stop uh, sharing your screen now. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that was a very lucid presentation by Dr. Sucheta. So after having seen this, we know that the majority of the short term outcomes and uh, long term benefits of RAS in the form of quality of life, especially with regard to cancer surgeries, has not been fully elucidated. In a systematic review, a recent one, which is uh, about 26 studies were uh, analyzed by uh, a group from China in 2021, they compared uh, RAS with versus conventional care. In the short term outcomes, mid term outcomes, which they defined like uh, riot and uh, long term outcomes like the overall survival and the disease free survival. And of course, cancer specific survival also. They analyzed uh, the studies uh, based on the degree of adherence to the protocols also. So they found that there is a definite improvement in short term and mid term outcomes with RAS, but it doesn't have significant effect on the long-term outcomes. Of course, they also mentioned that the, uh, the number which they studied was less. And uh, they also found that greater adherence to the protocols had better short-term outcomes. So going forward, we need to do more multicentric studies to assess the long-term outcomes in cancer patients, including their quality of life after going back home and uh, the disease-free survival and all these things have to be uh, analyzed and studied. So this will be uh, this one for a multi-centric study. So thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to take them. We have questions in the chat box. When the surgery is going on, any surgery going on for more than three to four hours, if you're using a second generation cephalosporin, it has to be given once in three hours. And if you're using a third generation cephalosporin, it has to be given once in four hours. And even if you're using metronidazole, you have to, as a prophylactic antibiotic, it has to be repeated once in three hours. So this is the recommendation for uh, antibiotic uh, during surgery. And... Uh, the there have been two more questions. Uh, Dr. Sucheta, can I ask you? Yes, ma'am. So, what is your experience of using albumin as a colloid? 
uh, as of now we have been using albumin for gynecological surgeries ma'am okay and what uh, we do you? have primary and uh, secondary cytoreductive surgeries where there is a uh, lot of uh, third spacing of the fluids right yeah so, so just to maintain a good perfusion pressure uh, we have been using colloids but they are not our primary objective we use them as a backup along with vasopressors and even for the transfusion of the blood if required so what is the concentration of um... Uh, as of now, we are using twenty percent albumin, ma'am. At a rate of around ten ml per hour, slow infusion will be given. And what about your experience with? Uh, you said you remove the NGTs and then monitor the outcome, right? Have there been any instances when you have had to reinsert them? Ha, huh, yes, ma'am, definitely. See, the point is, uh, eighty percent of the patients will benefit by not having a nasogastric tube. i definitely agree 20% of the patient who come under the high risk group or maybe because the type of surgery they have undergone for them we may have to reinsert the nasogastric uh, tube because on day 2 or day 3 there have been any surgical complications or even for a simple fact that the primary post operative ilus has not resolved but just for one blanket uh, like just for one point that we do not want to take a risk or we do not want to monitor we should not have it as a blanket therapy we have to think of the other 80% who very much benefits from removal of nasogastric tube and then would you say that you know uh, you got gastric dilatation do you sort of do an x ray for it or do you find it? uh more so on the clinical symptoms ma'am if the patient has not passed flatus or there is an uh, abdominal distension the patient is having nausea and vomiting then it is very particular on post op day 2 this is the uh, crucial period where the patient will either just move on in and become stabilized or they will worsen and what about using nitrous oxide as of now we are using ma'am some studies have definitely shown that use of nitrous oxide does not increase the uh, bloating of the intestines uh, we are definitely using in our institute what about nausea vomiting uh, does um... Uh, the effect of nitrous oxide and nausea and vomiting mm, no ma'am because of our anti emetic uh, this uh, anti emetic protocol our incidence is extremely low like even compared to my pg days and here i have seen the difference so i would uh, definitely say it is low so the current practice in your institute is mostly inhalation right it is not uh, uh, not tiva ma'am inhalation and anesthetics yeah We do have uh, other questions. So, Doctor Jodhna is asking as a part of re rehabilitation. What is your experience of anemia correction? So, Chita, did you get it? Uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am mm, as a protocol now we definitely have want to have a hp of around 9 to 10 for the patients if it is below 8 we will certainly advise for uh, pre operative blood transfusion if it is around 8 to 9 we are advising uh, iron therapies iron capsules uh, can i say something Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so you want to like give a you did, so you don't uh, advise some IV iron uh, because if you give uh, iron like iron tablets in the pre-op period. Uh, yes, sir. Both IV, IV and. Uh, both, yeah. Yes, sir. Both, both. Yeah. So yes, like sir. anemia correction, we mostly we do with like IV iron. Therapy. Yes, sir. IV iron infusions and, and iron capsules. Yeah, and 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 this pre-op blood transfusion, I will have some result. because unless the your this uh, <coughs> hb is like something or <coughs> something like that otherwise we mostly don't give blood transfusion because that uh, uh, again have a concern of uh, something yes sir yes a pre operative blood transfusion itself is a really big concern not good for the so, cancer patients yes sir so yes, unless sir. the hemoglobin is really low and the, the, the surgery we really need to do urgently then we can do otherwise we should we should be avoiding the blood transfusion in the pre op period yes, i we are The therapy we give like at least uh, uh, two weeks or uh, two weeks IV therapy, but like uh, 
two doses at uh, one week apart is good enough to increase I think it should be by one or two gram. Yeah, Dr. Sohan, I agree with you perfectly in the saying that uh, preoperative blood transfusion is not recommended. But unfortunately, we get to see the patients uh, uh, on the day prior to surgery. And uh, by that time, if the patient has been admitted, they, they would have received IV iron. And in case the hemoglobin is very low, the surgeon himself would recommend uh, the blood transfusion. So uh, there, we don't have much of a say uh, in, in that. Yeah. Uh, of course, in the post-operative period, we do try to restrict the blood transfusion as minimal as possible. We accept a hemoglobin of 8 grams per cent even in the post-operative period, unless the patient has some cardiac issues or something like that. Uh, even in the post-operative period, we use uh, IV iron uh, quite frequently in uh, most patients who have uh, hemoglobin less than 9 grams per cent. Uh, but again, it uh, many times the surgeon overrules our decisions and goes ahead and give, gives the blood transfusion in the wards where we don't normally go. So that is what happens. So uh, actually, it's like uh, like you said, it, it, it happens in many private practice. Like uh, we get to see the patient one day prior. But if if, if we are really uh, seeing the patient one day prior, then there will no chance of any optimization or pre and all these things. So I think we should start all these things when we see the patient in PSE. So if no, we, 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 like, see, huh? yes, we, we see the patient in the PSE, but we don't know when they're going to come and get admitted. We see them well in advance with PSE. Yeah. During that time, we recommend the IVIN and all those things. Yeah, so but when they're going to come and get admitted is what we... So like, uh, um, so like what we do, like we, our all... This thing, this prehabilitation part, all start when we see the patient in the PSE. So, like, whatever waiting list we have, like, if we have a waiting list of two weeks or one week, so that waiting list can be utilized to pre optimize the patient or do, do, do prehabilitation. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll not really will uh, do a, uh, this uh, good, <clears throat> good prehabilitation to the patient. So, uh, I think uh, with like all, all the residents or all, who are all listening, I think it should, it should be have a practice to like start all the prehab part right from the we see the patient at first time. Yeah, hello, Vinod. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just want to know when you see in the PAC, you see PAC quite uh, I think quite a few weeks back or maybe one to two weeks back. Uh, not so one to two weeks, ma'am. Not one to two weeks. We see the patient about maximum a week before, not one to two weeks. Um, it, so it's maybe so four or five is, days before that's all not uh, oh. <laughs> so that is also i think we should uh, to practice in, in us even in my institute also we can all the time we cannot see before uh, quite adequate time but yes. we try to implement that you can see previously we usually see with two three weeks before so that we can utilize that time that's so on says but i also want to know whether whenever you see the uh, patient for the first time do you screen hmm. the patient for anemia or uh, any yes, screening yes, yes. process for anemia we and do, do it? Yes, ma'am. We get all the entire uh, the complete uh, hemogram is uh, seen in this patient. So everybody, when they come for the first PSE itself, they have a complete hemogram with them. So we we do recommend them in our PSE chart itself. We advise uh, for uh, admission and uh, administration of uh, IV iron. Uh, but we we normally don't follow it up because we don't know. We give our recommendation, we accept the case for surgery, but the surgeon is the one who fixes up the date of surgery. So we don't know when they are getting uh, it. But uh, you are doing hemogram or anything else? Suppose hemoglobin less, do you want to see the patient again and do other investigation like ferritin, transplant saturation, all those things you do? So the screening of the anemia and then accordingly, patient needs the iron or patient needs something different. So whatever you decide. So that way you do the screening process or just hemogram you do that in the pre -operative not all, time period? Not in all patients. Ma Most of them, they okay. come with, we don't do in all the patients like that. Only in those patients who have very low hemoglobin <laughs> or in spite of uh, uh, iron transfusion or something like that, their hemoglobin is not improving. In those patients only we do the complete screening process. Not in all patients. Yeah, so mm -hmm. all the, in all these patients, I think first we have to do, we have to like we have to tell our surgeon that look, these mm -hmm. things are important. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless we talk to them, they are not going <clears throat> to listen. It takes so time. It takes be, time, uh, but uh, uh, can so I do that? Actually, see, the I, surgeons are very well sensitized to this. 
<laughs> they want their patients to go home as well. So actually what I have seen in my institutes, and I agree with uh, all three of you, this is a very vital point because pre-op anemia is a predictor of post uh, perioperative morbidity and mortality. So it is a very yes. important point. So correcting anemia pre-op is one of the major uh, points which will give you a good patient outcome. And I find that the surgeons are sensitized. Okay. And uh, similar to what Dr. Vinod said, uh, we do see the patients about two weeks or so prior. And even if they get two doses, that is enough. What I really want to point, point out is that, you know, we've been talking about 10 gram hemoglobin. That is not good enough. The WHO definition is much higher. So you need to go, you need to think of even patients who are coming to you with 10 and 11. They would also benefit from iron therapy. I take the point that, you know, iron studies uh, would add to how we treat our patients. But in most Indian patients, um, dietary insufficiency of iron is... Uh, you know, the likely cause of anemia. So giving them some iron uh, in a monitored setting would truly benefit them, I think. So, so like in our hospital, like any patient with a hemoglobin of less than 10, we all start with IV iron in the, from right from PSC, first PSC. And we also do this iron study in the patient to see if, if there is any iron deficiency or some vitamin B12 deficiency, something like that. So, uh, we we also do this all this in the TIBC. Mostly we found that patients are iron deficient anemia in India mostly. So it is good to have we'll give at least two doses of the IV iron. So and uh, and they mostly do well. So I think even if you have like see one week prior, and they will help with um, by getting two doses of IV yeah. iron. Hmm. Dr. Venon, there are two more questions in the chat box if you want to take them. Yeah. Uh, fluid of choice in fluid of choice in goal directed therapy. We are using uh, the balanced uh, fluid uh, balanced salt solution. We are using uh, uh, plasma light in our hospital, and uh, that's what we are using. Uh, under ERAS, ERAS also recommends uh, balanced salt solutions. It doesn't recommend uh, use of uh, normal saline uh, because of its uh, potency, potential to cause hyperchloremic acidosis and uh, reduce renal uh, particle blood flow. So uh, that is what we're using. Next thing is too many ERAS protocols, one for each surgery, confusing for the general surgical resident. If we need these to be implemented widely, why not? Not just by cancer specialists, we need to simplify your opinion. Let us have Sucheta's opinion on this. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, I don't think it's like A plus B plus C plus D that you have to memorize the stuff and implement. I feel it is a way of practice. That is, you are seeing your patient, you know what all the things to optimize for them you know, how, how the patient should be prior to a surgery, how, th how the thing should go in the intraoperative period and how to manage them in the postoperative period. It's really not like you're memorizing few things. It is your practice. It's your clinical practice. The way you see a patient and uh, tell them that they are good or they are bad, you go along with that. It is a clinical practice is what I feel. I think it's a very good question, actually, that there are many protocols from which to choose. So I think one thing that is important is what is possible in your setup. See, it will not be the same uh, across the board. So yeah. every institute, there'll be some things that will be possible, that will be doable easily, and perhaps a lot of them are being practiced anyway. So we're just putting it all together. This is just a way of bringing all the evidence together. And uh, as um, Dr. Jotsna and Dr. Sohan both pointed out, getting the surgeons on the same page. Yes, ma'am. It's about uh, having a team and it's about uh, all of them agreeing to go with the protocols. Yeah, also, I think it's better to do audit. Whatever you are practicing, uh, existing practice, how the result outcome with that existing practice. And always it's a team you can discuss with your surgeon. Uh, that's what we try to follow. Uh, we actually planning to do. Yeah, whatever do you do audit and discuss with the surgeon what else you can do for the betterment of the outcome. 
and uh, if we can follow one by one if it's possible to follow maybe we have many barriers many resistors i know that is in every hospital every institution but whatever barrier we face in each our, our hospital we can discuss with the surgeon and take one by one uh, barrier if we can cross it we can do something better than thing so uh, there are many 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 components of the illness and uh, many things are really not possible in our institution that is my feeling but it's audit is is a good thing you can do that yes madam so i agree that audit is also the part of the, the iras protocol you know every yes. iras protocol they, in the end they say the audit your practice whatever you are doing yes. practice so you are like implement in even in the best hospital in the world they have a like a compliance of around 80% so any compliance above 80% is considered very good we and our hospitals we have around 73 74% compliance to the iras protocol but we also think that we should go for the and we are doing since nine years so and we have a very good team of surgeon nurses physiotherapists nutrition everything and they like now it is like we need we don't, we don't need to tell anybody like you do this they they do their own their own work and uh, uh so just i want to ask one thing you mentioned that you give ors to the patient uh, like two hour prior to surgery right yes sir yes so um what does this ors contain it, it is ors having any any uh, this carbohydrate uh, no sir it is basically the carbohydrate loading initially what they did in the uh, eras protocol was that uh, they asked us to give around 12.5% of maltodextrin mm -hmm. that is the carbohydrate loading mm -hmm. and in few uh, uh, in a few papers they found that when the patient is given a carbohydrate load it actually decreases the insulin resistance in the intra and the post operative period yes but later many papers came up telling that this decrease in resistance in the uh, insulin resistance is actually questionable and also the american society they specifically told that it's not uh, needed to have a 12.5% of maltodextrin any amount of carbohydrate or any form of carbohydrate will do so as of now the evidence level for this is also around weak to moderate but the recommendation is still strong because it will give more so like a it will calm down the patient it will allay the anxiety and patient will not have that feeling of thirstiness uh, in the morning and yeah, studies so have shown that clear fluids will definitely move out of the stomach in 90 minutes so the 2 hour window period is sufficient for clear fluids yeah so so yeah, right so the in that means that your carbohydrate loading is required in the pre op period as per the, the eras protocols and then they say around 50 grams of carbohydrate this we give to the patient pre op yes, period sir. So, yes, uh, I don't know this ORS contain how much um, with um, glucose in that part because to to decrease your insulin resistance and all this part. But in, in our hospital, uh, we used to give epi. You know, this not epi phase, but epi around that that two hundred ml of the epi. It contain around forty two grams of uh, carbohydrate. So that we used to give. Now the this this commercially our um like preparation available. something other this the surgery carbon they are also available they are the complex carbohydrate uh, like as per the eras protocols now they are available in the market and uh, now we have switched to all this uh, we have almost stopped this uh, this this ap and now we are giving this complex carbohydrate so i don't have any experience of the ors but yeah ap we have given for so many years and now we are uh, like switching or almost switching to the this complex carbohydrate And so this uh, nappy uh, this uh, what we are using ors is also an apple juice only uh, okay. that also gives about uh, 30 to 40 uh, grams okay okay yeah, you, i don't have any idea about the ors so yeah. i asked it is it is and named as orsl but it's it doesn't actually uh, conform to the standards of ors and okay. regarding the surgica i do agree that uh, the, the volume is around 350 ml and i think Hmm. the sorry the cost of surgica when compared to ap is, yeah, it, 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 is very it, it, it much higher yeah yeah, yeah it, it is around it, 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 around, around 400 rupees for one bottle yeah. 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 yeah so so our being a price sensitive hospital it's uh, it's difficult to use all these things and moreover when uh, several studies have shown that you don't actually need to give the complex carbohydrates and it doesn't make any difference with regard to insulin resistance 
Uh, we thought we will just give any carbohydrate drink and uh, the ORS yeah, yeah, fine. was fine. Yeah. And 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 also like we uh, so, so like to the um, patient with the diabetes, so that yeah. those patients do not require carbohydrate. For in that we can also only the that the, the, the water is required. So you you also mentioned that you give this IV dexamethasone and onesetter to all the patients. So do you also give the dexa to the diabetes patient? Yes, yes, we give it to diabetic patients also, and we have seen that it hardly causes any uh, significant uh, increase in sugars. It very rarely one. It we give only one dose okay. at the beginning of surgery, and uh, towards the end of surgery, we do we don't see any significant uh, increase in the uh, GRBS of the patients. Okay. Can I ask a question, Dr. Sujita, uh, with regard to the discussion on audit? So, um, you've had some experience of implementing this over the last seven years, right? So, uh, I've, been, I've been working here for the past five years. So, uh, I, currently, I am doing a study on uh, radical cystectomies, which we have done under spinal anesthesia with uh, implementation of ERAS protocol. So I'm doing a retrospective study and uh, collecting data of over uh, uh, seven years. So would that be spinal with epidural? Yes, spinal epidural, yes. So how long do these cases take? Uh, these cases, initially as the surgeon started, it was around seven hours, but uh, up until 2020, it was reduced to around four and a half hours. After that, he shifted to robotic surgery, ma'am. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, has there been any audit which showed any improvement in patient outcomes? I know you said that, you know, defining recovery is very difficult. But yes, ma'am. Uh, so, as of now, uh, there are three to four papers being uh, done by our department. So, for different surgeries, uh, colon surgeries, head and neck surgeries, and uh, urology and gynecological surgeries. So, maybe in another few months, we will only be able to present the paper from our hospital. It's quite wide ranging, so we look forward to your uh, results. Yes, ma'am. I believe we have answered all the questions. Uh, Dr. Vinod, do you want to make the concluding remark? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I think most of the questions have been answered, and uh, uh, I hope there. Are, if anybody else has any questions, please, please feel free to ask. And. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Anjali ma'am, for giving us this opportunity to present from our department. And uh, I hope it was a uh, uh, useful lecture. And uh, thank you so much. I thank even Clarinet for uh, the uh, for, for thank, you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sucheta. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity, ma'am. And I would like to thank Dr. Sohan Solanki and Dr. Jyotsna Goswami for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, thank, you thank, you <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sucheta. It is very good presentation, lucid presentation. And it's nice for discussion, Dr. Vino. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is uh, it has actually so well practiced everywhere. But everybody is trying to practice many some components. It's good to discuss repeatedly and try to follow and try to implement. And I will also request to her, Anjali, that we can have, we should do some multicentric stress study, but at least a multicentric record record together, and then how much you are practicing yes, yes. in so your like, like, That will be... Yeah, one we already started and about to yeah. study. Yes. And yes. then we, we will soon uh, take over another study. Yes. So, so uh, I, I, will, I will tell that all the centers, they should take lead in one study. Yes. All the study oh. I cannot start. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So we can, uh, no, what I was thinking, what I was thinking, if we can have on uh, among our cancer hospitals, it does registry sort of thing. How many uh -huh. we are practicing? How what is the outcome? How we are, how we can improve on it? Something like that, if you can do, it is a good thing because it is a it is not a new thing. It's a quite a old thing, and it is practicing in our um, other countries quite long. But they are trying to improve more and more. So why not we can start our own registry and you can see how much you are practicing and then you can improve on that. That yes, can be a thing we thought of later on. So, so, so let's Mala, uh, the, from SOPSI will like start uh, this the thing. Uh, yes, some uh, registry sort of thing. Like even do uh, registry and something like on for three, uh, some three or four studies will start soon. 
Yes, yeah, so we can also try one, and every institution can try, start one. It's yeah, so so I think every should say to take lead in one study because so yeah, it not be burden on one person. Mm, sure, sure, that's good, good idea. Well, good. Uh, today's discussion is quite nice, and it's a nice presentation by Dr. Sucheta. And thank you, Dr. Vinod, for moderating it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I would thank also you. like to thank all our audience. Um, I can see that quite a few of you have hung on towards the end. Thank you so much. And wish you a very good evening. I would like to hand over to Ankita for the closure. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for your valuable insights. And thank you to all the participating doctors. And uh, with all your permission, we would like to conclude the session over here. Thank you.